So we might have enough where we can go ahead and at least get through these introductory slides. So I'll start just by introducing myself. My name's Daniel Brannick. I'm a senior data scientist at Elder Research. Uh, so I'll talk about Elder Research in just a second. But this webinar, just to introduce the topic, is on the tyranny of coincidence. And so we'll be going over how to help prevent uh, spurious relationships in data appearing significant. Uh, because obviously when that happens, you can draw incorrect insights, your models are less accurate than they could be, uh, and ultimately you might end up misleading when you don't mean to mislead. So let's... First at the top, we'd just like to do a quick plug for the Nime Fall Summit. So I, I went to the last couple fall summits that were non-virtual uh, in the US and they were great, highly recommended. Uh, this one, I guess, will be online, but I'm sure it'll be great as well. So I uh, would encourage you all to go to the link and check that out. So just a little bit about Elder Research before we begin. So uh, Elder Research is, is really one of the first, if not the first, uh, boutique data science consultancy in the United States. So we've got 25 years plus uh, doing data science work uh, exclusively. And then we have over 90 experts uh, in data science who, who work for us. We've got five locations, mostly along the eastern coast of the US, but also an office in, in London and in the UK. And you can kind of see along the bottom here what, what we like to focus on. So we really cover the entire data science spectrum from machine learning models to text mining to uh, big data stuff in the cloud, uh, graph analytics. We really cover it all. The, uh, three big pillars of our business are strategy sessions with organizations to help them come up with a roadmap for how they can be better at data science going forward. Uh, lots of companies uh, know they aren't doing the best job or, or aren't taking advantage of the full uh, capacity for data science at their organization. Either they have data or they want to get more data so we can, we can help talk through strategies. Uh, we also will do data science consulting. This is really bread and butter of our business. This is what we've done for a very, very long time. Uh, if you have a particular problem you need help solving or you have data you're not sure how to use, uh, we can come in and help with that. And then also we do a lot of analytics training. So this is corporate trainings. This is uh, on-site training for, for government clients. Uh, this ranges from a day to two days to you know 12 week courses where, where employees can, can take a course every week and really take business analyst skills and try and morph them into something that might have a little more rigor uh, and more towards the data science end of uh, that spectrum. So that's a little bit about elder research. I won't harp on it. If you have any questions, please feel free to jump into the Q&A. So on, in the Zoom interface, uh, I think we have a slide and a couple slides just on, on where you can find that. And then, uh, if you see a question you like, feel free to press that little thumbs up button so we know it's important to multiple people. This session will be available on YouTube, uh, so you can always watch it later. And we'll send out an email, I think tomorrow sometime, that'll have links to both the slides and the workflow, the NIME workflow that I'll be going through uh, over the course of the, the presentation. So uh, here's where you can get to that Q&A. I think it's, well, if you can't find it, I, I well, if you can't find it, I guess you can't ask, can you? I don't think it's too hard to find in the Zoom interface. Uh, it, for me, it's along the top. When I, when I look at the little scroll down for you, it might be along the right, but we trust that you'll be able to find it. Oh, along the bottom, there you go along the bottom and then you can type your question in the in the box and I either will answer it live or someone might get back to you right away uh, with a text response. Uh, if if whoever's manning the answers can't answer it right away, then then I'll address it uh, live at some point. Okay, so how science goes wrong was a, a big article in The Economist uh, years and years ago. The problem obviously started long before that even, uh, but this is just one symptom 
of a larger issue. And, and what this article was talking about was scientific studies publishing results with p-values, right? So I think we're all relatively familiar with statistics p-values. You know, if something has a low p-value, then it should be unlikely to be by chance. It should be a real result if it has a low p-value. But what people were finding was that these studies were published with very low p-values. And when people tried to reproduce them, they were not getting those same p-values. And not only that, but they were seeing a smaller effect size, uh, sometimes the opposite effect size. And it was across multiple domains. It was in psychology, it was in chemistry, it was in biology. And you can imagine why this was happening. You have thousands, tens of thousands of people, researchers studying uh, science in their domain all the time. And only significant results get published. No one, or it used to be, that no one would publish a result saying, hey, we tested this thing, and turns out, nah, there's not much there. So when only significant results are published, uh, anything that looked significant just by chance is going to get published, and anything that looked insignificant because it wasn't significant is just not going to get published, and it's not going to get seen. And so this is a result from 2015 where they tried to reproduce psychology studies. And what they found was that among those, they could even reproduce the methodology. The effect size was certainly not reproduced. So along the x-axis there, you see the original effect size, and then the diagonal line would be where the effect size should be uh, if it's equal to the replicated effect, uh, if the original effect and the replicated effect are equal. And you can see that in all of these red dots, the original effect size was higher than the replicated effect size. So that, that's obviously a problem. And it's a problem for a few reasons. One of them is that, you know, maybe it's harder to trust some of these scientific studies unless you can really read the details and get into the weeds and look at how the analysis was done. But the other reason it's dangerous, and so this is a more recent article in Nature from 2018, is that it, it throws into a question all of these scientific studies. So just like tobacco lobbyists used to try and muddy the waters about how dangerous cigarettes were. We have more modern examples like climate change deniers uh, where people can say, well, look at all these studies that, that weren't reproduced. Therefore, we can uh, dismiss all of them outright. And so that, that obviously is dangerous because if we can't trust scientists to study the science, then, then who can we trust to study the science? So this is a far reaching problem, but it's not only a problem for research scientists. This is a problem that uh, affects us. Uh, and maybe you are a research scientist. I am not a research scientist. Uh, I, in the data science field, we do lots of different tests for significance. Uh, we do lots of different comparisons. And so here's just a few ways that this same problem where you have lots of different comparisons, so some look uh, significant by chance, can affect us in our daily lives. So or in our daily analysis, if you have 300 variables, which I think is common and becoming increasingly common in the data we have access to now, if you have 300 variables and you're going to check all of them for whether or not they're significantly related to some target variable, some of them might look significant just by chance. Uh, let's say you also set up a grid search either in, in NIME or in some other platform to compare the, the accuracies of a thousand models. This might give you an inflated expectation of accuracy. Uh, even a single variable that has 50 categories. So, so if you have data from America and you're using the state or the residence of uh, some subject, that can be in and of itself uh, dangerous, especially with some techniques that we'll talk about in a bit. And then finally, this is a common thing that we see, uh, especially among business analysts, is just relying on cross-validation to get your final evaluation accuracy. Uh, and that can be really dangerous as well, even if you think you're following all the best practices. So we'll talk about each of these in turn and kind of what we can do to uh, give ourselves more realistic expectations. So the first step is to recognize and understand the problem, right? So one of the big problems here is vast search. If we test enough hypotheses, some are going to look significant just by chance, right? So we've covered that. And the challenge here is that although any p-value constitutes a test, not every test that we perform actually has a p-value. If you're comparing the results of two models to see which is more accurate, that is a test. That you're, you're, you're 
making some judgment. But you're not, you're probably not calculating a p-value to see the likelihood that one test, one model is better than the other. It's just a comparison you're making and you're eyeballing it. Uh, the other thing that, that compounds this problem is that humans are incredibly good at making a story for almost anything. Uh, you know, it, it's, we are required to understand the world as best we can to function. Uh, but that skill at creating stories has really profound impacts on how we analyze data. So here's just one example. We, there's a, a public autism data set that we use in a lot of our trainings. And the goal of the data set is to predict from characteristics taken at birth, whether or not a child will eventually be diagnosed with autism. And one of those variables is the socioeconomic status of the family that the child was born into. And sometimes when I teach this course, I forget whether a higher number, so the socioeconomic economic status in the state is just listed from zero to 10, it's an integer uh, variable. And sometimes I forget whether a higher number means richer or a higher number means poorer. And so when we teach this data, sometimes it can look like a higher number is associated with higher rates of autism or a, a higher socioeconomic status is associated with higher rates of autism. And sometimes it looks like a lower socioeconomic status is associated with higher rates of autism. And in either case, students can always come up with a story to, to answer why that might be the case. So if it's a lower economic status associated with higher rates of autism, then they'll say that you know, a poor family has, may have worse diet, they may have financial stress in the family, they may have poor health care, and so that's resulting in these autistic cases. Meanwhile, if you have the richer families having a higher case of autism, then you might have a, a case where it's just being detected more often. Maybe an affluent family is more likely to have their child formally diagnosed with autism. So both of these stories make complete sense, and yet they're completely opposite. So you can use your data to justify just about any story. And in case you're curious, the data that we're working with, it's actually the first story or the first claim that ends up being true, uh, but who knows the accurate reason behind it. That story is just one that we made up. So what can we do to protect ourselves against this problem? One technique is called target shuffling. And so this is something that John Elder, the founder of Elder Research, sort of rediscovered. He, he came up with it independently and then found, oh, well, somebody else actually came up with it independently before I did. So he likes to say he rediscovered this technique. But the basic idea here is we want to compare the strength of our result, be it the accuracy of a model or something else. We want to compare the strength of our result to the likely strength that we can expect via random chance. And so Target shuffling involves these five steps. First, you build a model. Uh, you know, you, you do your feature selection, you do your cross-validation, you do your holdout sample, whatever it is that you want to do. And then you determine your model's strength. So that could be R squared, it could be correlation, it could be explanatory power. But let's say you build a model and you're, you're going to use R squared and it has an R squared of 0 0.8. You essentially write down that 0 0.8. Uh, in NIME, we have a target shuffling node uh, due in large part to John Elder asking for one. So we have a target shuffling node that will take your data and shuffle just the target vector. So the input data is left totally alone. Your, your independent predictors of the model are left untouched, but you are shuffling, you are randomizing just that variable that you're trying to predict. The result is that your input data should have no bearing whatsoever on that target data. You should be able to do a very bad, you should only be able to do a bad job predicting that target after doing this shuffling. Once you have the shuffled data, you do the same exact process that you did for your real data. You search for the best model. You do your cross-validation, you do your feature selection, you do your holdout sample, and you try and, and, and you write down, uh, how well did I do? essentially. So let's say you shuffle the data and you get a new point, you get a new R squared of 0 0.55. Uh, or actually that's unlikely. After shuffling the data, let's say you get an R squared of 0 0.1. You then write down that 0 0.1 and you throw out the model. The model doesn't mean, mean anything. And you repeat, you repeat steps two and three until you've done it 
enough times to build a reasonable distribution. So let's say you do this 100 times, which means you have shuffled data 100 times, you have built this fake model 100 times, and you have a distribution of fake results. So you might have a model with an R squared of 0.1, a model with an R squared of 0.15, an R, an R, a model with an R squared of 0 0.02, and then you compare your real R squared to this distribution of R squareds. And what you should find if you've done a good job building your model and your data is actually useful for predicting your target, you should find that your real model beats is better than all of these fake models. It's, it should be better than the R squared from all of these uh, randomly shuffled input, uh, all these randomly shuffled uh, pieces of data. And so we call uh, uh, the, the distribution of strengths the best apparent discoveries. And you uh, essentially, this is your more accurate p-value, right? So if you have, if you're wanting to use a p-value of 0.05, then you should be trying to beat 95% of these shuffled uh, iterations. So I just saw a question pop up, and I'm happy to answer that. The dummy target is constructed not using random numbers. It is the same as the original target variable, just in a random order. So it, the reason this is helpful is uh, that means that all of your true, that means all of the target uh, values are reasonable values, right? Because if you, if you impute with uh, random numbers, you might get some values that are totally outlandish. This way, they're all uh, real values that are feasible from the data that we've gotten. It's a great question. So let's do a quick example. And uh, apologies to everyone for, for being so stereotypically American. If you're not in America, this is a baseball example. Uh, but I think it's instructive. So this represents every pitch that was thrown uh, in every baseball game from June 1st, 2013. And we have plotted each pitch along three axes. So you have the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, and then this depth axis. The horizontal and vertical axes represent just the position of the ball. So if you're not familiar with baseball, the pitcher is just throwing the ball uh, towards the batter so the batter can try and hit it. And they have to be within a certain range. And uh, the horizontal and vertical axis here are just showing geographically where was the ball when it was at the point where the batter could hit it. The third axis here is the pitch velocity. How fast was the pitch thrown? And so, in this case, what we're going to be looking at is which region of this sort of invented 3D space has the highest percentage of hits. So if you're the pitcher, you want to avoid regions in which the batter is more likely to hit it. So a blue dot here represents a successful pitch, meaning the uh, pitch was a strike, the batter missed the ball. A red dot is a hit, meaning the batter hit the ball. So let's say we're pitchers, we're trying to figure out which region in this 3D space do we want to avoid? Because batters are more likely to hit the ball if we throw it into that space. So we're going to do a simple Z proportion test and just look at the p-values. So this first little region here has 11 strikes and two hits. That's 15% hits if you just do two divided by 13. Uh, if we compare that to the population prevalence of hits, we have a population prevalence of 9.4%. So our p-value here is 0 0.4. It's a pretty low sample size. It's unlikely, or it's, it's pretty likely that this happened by random chance. Uh, so we can find a new region. In this region, we have one hit and 17 strikes. So that's only 5.6%. But again, due to the low sample size, uh, this actually isn't that unusual. Uh, it's got a p-value of 0.56. That's still a pretty high p-value. And we go through every single region in the data here until finally, so there's a total of 41, we find the one with the lowest p-value. And so that happens to be this box here, in which there are 28 strikes and nine hits. Now, that results in a hit percentage of 24%. That is statistically significantly greater than the population prevalence of 9.4% hits. So at first glance, it seems like, hey, there's only a point three, five percent chance that this happened uh, just randomly. So as a pitcher, we're thinking we don't want to throw the ball into this region at that speed. But 
we're going to use target shuffling to see whether or not this is actually all that unusual. We checked 41 different regions. Maybe just by virtue of checking 41 different regions, uh, there is bound to be one that has a low p-value. So let's check. What we've done here is just changed which dots are red and which dots are blue. So the important thing here is that we have checked, we have left each dot in the same place. The input data, which is just these three variables, the vertical, horizontal position, and the pitch velocity, have stayed the same. All that we're changing is the color, meaning whether or not that pitch was struck by the batter or whether it was missed by the batter. And we can do this and then reevaluate every single region of this area. And so this region that we checked uh, originally, and we're going to check it again with this new shuffled version of the data, has nine strikes and four hits. So it has 31% hits. Uh, and then we can calculate the p-value for that is 0 0.017. And we can go through and essentially check every single region with this new shuffled data. And we'll figure out which region has the lowest p-value. And we're going to write down what that p-value is. So in this example, in this version of the shuffled data, this region that's shown here has the lowest p-value. And it has a p-value of 0 0.01. So this histogram is going to be showing us our true result, which is the red line. This is the result we observed with the actual data. And then the blue bars are going to represent results that we saw in randomly shuffled data. So we want our true p-value to be much lower than the p-values that we're getting after randomly shuffling, shuffling the data. Because after randomly shuffling the data, no region should be any different than the population. All the regions should have the same probability of a batter hitting the ball. So we go through and we shuffle the data a bunch of different times until finally we have built up a reasonable distribution. So in this example, we've done a thousand different trials, which means we've done 1,000 different shuffles of the target data. And for each shuffle, we have found the most significant region. And then we've plotted the p-value for that most significant region on this histogram. And you can see that our true result only beats about 82% of the random shuffles, meaning over 18% of the time, random data generated a result more extreme than the one we observed in the true data, which suggests that maybe our true data isn't actually that extreme of a result. As a pitcher who is analyzing this data, I would say, well, then I'm not going to put a lot of stock in these results. If there's a 20% chance almost that this was just random chance, then I'm not going to change how I pitch to accommodate the recommendations put forth by, by this data. So that's the idea behind target shuffling. And this is just one example. Uh, we're going to show more examples here in NIME that I think will be uh, more relevant to what, what you guys do. Because I, I assume that the vast majority of you are not professional pitchers in baseball. So let's, I'm going to drag the NIME workflow on here and introduce this, uh, introduce this simulated data. So we like to use simulated data. Uh, and please throw in the chat uh, or in the questions I, I, if this is too small or if you need me to, to go back and look at something. But we like to use simulated data because then no one can invent a story that explains some variable. So if we use the autism data, for instance, uh, and we tried to say that we know this feature isn't important, then somebody might chime in and say, well, hold on, have you considered such and such reason why that variable might be important? So no, we're not gonna bother with it. We're gonna do simulated data and we're going to generate a bunch of random variables. And so these are just some components that I made. Uh, we've got 25 uniform variables, 25 Gaussian variables. These are all just generating random distributions. Uh, we've got one categorical feature with 50 levels and then a another categorical feature with 20 levels. Uh, and we're going to generate all of these variables for uh, 2,000 observations. So when we append all these variables together, this is what it ends up looking like. We have a bunch of random variables. This is, uh, and they go from uniform one 
all the way over to you know, uniform 25 and then Gaussian one over to Gaussian 25. These are all just completely random. Uh, and then we have these two categorical predictors here that take on uh, this string value of class one, class two, class three, and so on. The rule engine and math formula nodes uh, we're using to define a target variable. So if we go into this math formula node, we can see that we are using Gaussian one, normal one, and then a categorical effect to define our target variable. And then we're adding a random term in here because life isn't perfect. And so if we didn't include a random term, it'd be really easy to predict this data, but that's not at all realistic. Uh, the thing to know here uh, is that the categorical effect is from the second class of the first categorical variable. Uh, that's just to introduce the idea that categorical features can be important, and we'll come back to that in a bit. The main thing to remember is that Gaussian one and uniform one are the only continuous variables being used to define the target. Meaning if any other continuous variables are predictive of the target, it's just by random chance. So I'm not gonna go through all these nodes, obviously, uh, because we don't have nearly enough time for that. Uh, what I'm going to do is step through the key results. And so we're gonna partition the data here into test and train. And we're going to send the training data up to a linear regression learner. The, I'd like to cover, uh, this is using four quick examples uh, of different feature selection techniques. And so the most common feature selection technique that we see when we go on site somewhere is the one that you learn in you know, your introductory statistics class. It makes sense. You plug in all your models into a linear or all your variables into a linear regression, and you just try and determine which ones have a low p-value, which ones are statistically significant. Anything with a high p-value, we throw out. Anything with a low p-value, we keep in the model, right? That, that's what you're taught in school. And so let's look at the coefficients for this model. Oh, appeared on a different screen. And so we're going to sort these, co oh, all right, I'd already done it. Sort these coefficients by their p-value. And we can see, hey, great, uniform one and Gaussian one both have very low p-values, which suggests these are predictive variables. That's perfect. We designed this data in such a way that we know that those two are indeed important. But the most common p-value that we see used is 0.05. So we would actually keep any variables below 0.05. In this case, any reasonable p-value would probably dictate you include uniform 22 and Gaussian 24. But we made this data. We know uniform 22 and Gaussian 24 have no bearing whatsoever on the target. Uh, so this is misleading, right? Because we're going to build this model with two variables and think that they're very important when in actuality, they're not even remotely important. The other thing to point out is that all of these different categorical things look Pot, potentially important, but if we use a p-value of 0.05, we'll cut it off here. These three features are not important. Uh, categorical one class two is important. So I guess you could argue that the other classes of categorical one are important because they're not class two, but in practice, there's 50 of them. So it's unlikely that's what it's picking up on. Uh, you can see that these also appear important probably by, by random chance. So what can we do about it? We know this is a good way of selecting features. It did a good job of choosing the two that matter. But is there some better way to determine the cutoff? And that's what target shuffling is going to help us do. And so here we've set up a counting loop start. So we're just gonna do this 100 times. Uh, and what we're going to do is shuffle the target. So we just choose which variable we wanna shuffle. And when you look at the output of that node, all of the input data is exactly the same. All that's changed is this variable. 5.897 used to belong to a different observation. Now it belongs to the first observation. We're going to do the same exact process that we just did. We're going to build a linear regression. And then we're going to extract from this bottom port the coefficients and the p-values for all the variables that we threw into the model. Uh, there's a little bit of housekeeping stuff we have to do. We have to throw out the p-value for the intercept. The intercept is always going to be very significant for this data because the mean value is around five. So obviously the intercept is important. We don't want that to hamper our results. 
But in this group by node, what we're going to do is for each iteration, so we did 100 different iterations, for each iteration, we're going to choose the minimum p-value uh, across all the variables, except for the intercept. We're going to choose the minimum value across all variables for that iteration. We're going to do a cross join and a rule engine node. You're welcome to look through these after the fact to make sure you understand how this is all working. Uh, but the key thing that I want to show you is just the result. This is our updated significance. So you want to sort by ascending order. And what this is telling us is that in 0% of the 100 iterations that we did, was there a variable more important than Gaussian 1 and Uniform 1? So we tried this 100 times. We did 100 iterations. The best, most predictive variable from each of those iterations was always less predictive than our two known relevant features. However, you can see what happened to the p-value here, the new significance of Gaussian 22, or uniform 22 and Gaussian 24. Before they had a p-value of 0 0.002 and 0 0.004. This new significance is showing a significance of 13% and 25%. That's comforting because we know they are not important. And what this means is that in 13% of the 100 trials, at least one variable was more significant than uniform 22 was in the original data. And at, at least 25% or and 25% of the time, at least one variable was more significant in the shuffled data than Gaussian 24 was in the real data. And so if we want to use a p-value of 0 0.05, that's great. You know, that's that's perfectly reasonable. This is where we want to use it. And we would accurately say Gaussian 1, Uniform 1 are the most important. The rest of the stuff can be dropped. You'll note the shortcoming here, which is that uh, Categorical 1 Class 2 here, which we know is important, uh, has a p-value of 1, suggesting it's not important. But that's more a limitation of, the, uh, of a limited sample size. Uh, we don't really stand a chance of detecting that. We have 50 classes here, which means only a few observations are going to have categorical one class two. So it's just going to be really challenging for any model to detect that uh, with this sample size. So just in case you don't believe me uh, that this is the better way of doing it, we can go through and build our linear regression using the four originally predicted variables. Uh, and technically, it also said to include categorical one. Trust me on this, if you include categorical one, it gets much worse with on the test data. Uh, but let's, so let's just include these four continuous variables and build a model and evaluate that model on holdout data. So I'm going to execute and open views. And what you can see here is that the R squared is 0 0.358. Let's see what happens if we just eliminate these two features that we know are not good based on the target shuffling and based on building the actual data. Our R squared went from 0.358 up to 0 0.37. It improved the holdout accuracy just by virtue of removing variables from the model. Uh, hopefully this indicates to you that the original model is overfit because we included features that looked important on the training data, but weren't actually important on that holdout data. So I think this is a pretty cool result. Uh, the target shuffling here shows very clearly which two features are actually important. So let's see what happens if we try something similar, but instead of using a linear regression, we use a random forest. We don't have time to get into all the details of how a random forest works, how a decision tree works, and why this is so different than the linear regression. Uh, just know that a random forest, similar to the linear regression, has a means of showing variable importance. So if we look at the attribute statistics coming out of the model, we get these three variables that show us essentially how many times a variable was used in the decision trees that make up the random forest. And so a split at level zero means that variable was very important. A split at level one means that variable was still pretty important. And a split at level two uh, is the same thing, just slightly less than the earlier two. So it's basically in, in order of descending importance here, but a higher number in all three cases 
indicates an important variable. And so if we just sort these by split zero, we see a problem. And this is the problem that a random forest has. It is incredibly susceptible to inflated importance among categorical features. Uh, it's universal across decision trees in random forest. If you try and put a feature in with a lot of different levels, it's going to look more important than it really is. Uh, fortunately, our two actually important continuous features are the next two most important, and you can see that trend continues for the other, the other split levels. What we're going to do here is we need one value to compare our real version to our shuffled versions. So let's look at this newly calculated importance variable, which all it is is a linear combination of these three uh, variables. So if we sort this descending, this is a new single variable that represents the importance and summarizes the information across all three of these splitting variables. And you can see the same result. Uh, the two categorical features are the most important, followed by the uh, two continuous features, and then uh, it continues down from there. And we're going to do the exact same process of shuffling the target and then regenerating importances for those uh, predicted features. And what we get, goodness, it keeps opening on the wrong screen, it is an updated significance. And I made one important change in this case. Note here that the significance of the two continuous features is zero. The only reason that's possible is because in the shuffled model, I have elected to exclude categorical one and categorical two. The reason I did that is because I know that even in a random variable or even in a random problem, these two variables are going to look important to the random forest. So when you're comparing accuracies across different variable types, just be very aware of the limitations of the algorithm you're using. In this case, a random forest is very limited uh, by categorical features. So if we go back into this group by table, you can see that a random forest actually does an even better job of distinguishing importance than the linear regression did. It basically gives every single variable a value of either zero or one. The zero we consider important and the ones we consider unimportant uh, with the exception of these two categorical features due to the, the limitations, inherent limitations of a random forest. So hopefully that makes sense. If we're going to talk about feature selection in NIME, uh, it would be wrong of me not to mention these two pre-built meta nodes that come with NIME. So there's the forward feature selection meta node and the backward feature selection meta node. Uh, I actually really like these nodes. So if we just open it up real quick, it's doing something pretty cool. It's iterating through all the features. It's partitioning the data. And then it's determining feature importance according to accuracy on a holdout set. Because it partitions the data, calculates or builds a model, evaluates the model on a holdout set, and then computes the accuracy. Uh, it then determines after adding a new feature, did that make the accuracy better or worse? And so if it made the accuracy better, then great, it keeps it in. If it made the accuracy worse, then it kicks it out. So I think this is actually a pretty clever little meta node here. Uh, and you can see the effect here. So if you look at the output, uh, with, let's look at it here. If you look at the output of the forward feature selection bottom output node, what it does is it filters the data for you. And so here it has filtered all the variables that it thinks are important. So obviously there's a problem here. We know we only have two important features and yet it chose 51 features to include in the model. So uh, the low sample size here means that out of the box default didn't do a phenomenal job, but it did do one very important thing. It did drop the categorical features because those things were so detrimental to the validation accuracy that it knew it needs to get rid of those categorical features. So uh, this did a good job of eliminating the features that are certainly harmful to the model, but maybe was overly inclusive uh, of the features that, that should not have been included. Uh, and you can always change that if you want in the feature selection filter. 
Right now, what I have selected is select the best score overall. You could also select by a threshold, uh, which can help you uh, manually tune this node a little bit into something that you think is more reasonable. So the same is true of the backward feature selection. I won't go into details because uh, I want to make sure there's a little bit of time for questions. The, one, the other thing I would say is that you can plug in different models here. I, I included the random forest learner and predictor here to illustrate that even though random forests do a bad job with categorical features, this method of using random forests actually was successful at removing those categorical features. So it's a pretty neat, pretty neat little setup that that NIME has with these feature selection meta nodes. Okay, the last thing we're going to cover here is the idea of these grid searches. And these have become more and more common. You see it all the time with companies that claim to automatically build a model. Hey, just give us the data and we will automatically uh, build the best possible model. And we're going to try it on linear regressions. We're going to try it on a random forest. We're going to build neural network, SVMs. We're going to do everything in the, in the playbook here and determine the best possible model. Well, that could be kind of dangerous if not done correctly. So this is the same exact ABT generation node uh, or ABT generation box. I just didn't want it coming all the way down here. Um, so I've just copied and pasted it. But we're going to do the same thing. We're going to partition the data and we're going to use what many people would consider best practices, right? So we're going to use the X partitioner node, which is going to do cross validation. And we're going to, let me see, I think we're only doing three fold, uh, two fold cross validation because this was taking a long time to run. Uh, but obviously you could increase that. But we're going to do cross validation and determine what is the best possible configuration of this gradient boosted trees node to give us the most accurate model? So if you've never used these parameter optimization loop start and parameter optimization loop end nodes, they're really, really cool. Uh, so if you open one up, you can basically specify uh, uh, different flow variables. And we're going to basically evaluate a bunch of different models. So we're going to go uh, if you're familiar with how gradient boosted trees work, we're going to try 200 trees up to 400 trees, iterating by 50. So we're going to try 200, 250, 300, 350, 400. We're going to try different depths of the composite decision trees. We're going to use a bunch of different learning rates. We're going to try 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15. And then we're going to try different data fractions, which is uh, referring to the bootstrap sampling that happens between the different models. So. The important thing, the important takeaway here is we're going to build a bunch of different models and compare the accuracies. And the accuracies that we're comparing are derived from cross-validation. We see this all the time. People want to use cross-validation because it, they think it means, oh, if I use cross-validation, I don't need to have a holdout set. You know, the training data is built on different data than it's being evaluated on. So we're done. So let's see what happens. Let's uh, let's build a bunch of different models. We're going to evaluate the models with cross-validation, and then we're going to look at how accurate are those models. And in this case, it pops up on a different screen every time. In this case, we're going to evaluate on mean absolute error, and we're just going to sort by this. It's called the objective value. So if we sort by descending, these are the worst models. Uh, 250 trees, a learning rate of 0.15. If we sort by ascending, this is the best possible model. This is a model with 400 models, 400 trees, a max depth of those trees of five, uh, a relatively small learning rate of 0.05, and we're going to use 90% of the data for each composite tree that makes up the gradient boosted trees model. Okay, and oh, and what we what we expect to see, because again, this is cross validation, meaning the models were built and evaluated on different data. We expect to see a mean absolute error of 1.307. So what we're going to do now is take that same training data that we used here and plug it into a gradient boosted trees model. We're going to specify 90% of the data. We're going to specify a learning rate of 0.05 with 400 trees, a depth of five. This should, uh, I think that matches. Yep, that matches exactly what we have here. So 
you know, this is cross-validation. We should see an, a, a mean absolute error of 1.307. And instead what we get is a mean absolute error of 1.32. Uh, that may not sound like a huge difference to you, but let's look at these models. 1.32 is all the way down here. It takes it from the best model to there being six models that seemingly have better performance. What this suggests is that by using cross-validation and testing, how many models did we test here? We only tested 180 different models. By testing 180 models and picking the one with the highest accuracy, we have inflated our expectation of accuracy. If we were to take this same model and apply it to holdout data as we did here, this is true holdout data, it wasn't used in the cross-validation, what we see is worse accuracy than what we got in the cross-validated sample, even though the cross-validated sample is using different data for the train and test for each individual model. This is a problem with 180 models. You can imagine how much of a problem it becomes if you have a thousand models or two thousand models that you're uh, comparing. Uh, it's also a problem if you're comparing completely different model types. If you're comparing random forests and, and support vector machines and all of that, then you're going to again run into the same issue. It's not just with hyperparameter tuning that you run into this problem. So those are the main points I wanted to cover here. I think I've gotten to the end of my workflow. We'll post the workflow to the NIME hub and we'll send out a link where you can get to it through with an email. Uh, but that's pretty much all, all that I have prepared here. Uh, I'll kind of open it up for questions. If people want to ask questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but if not, we can, we can call it. So I'll stay on for another few minutes and, and wait for any questions that come in. But uh, thank you all for, for joining and sticking around to the end. Okay, got a question here. Would it make sense when performing target shuffling with random forest to do it two times? One iteration for numeric, and one for categorical? That's a really interesting question. I think uh, the short answer is yes, I think it makes sense. Uh, you're still gonna run into a little bit of a problem because you're making basically two comparisons, but making two comparisons is a whole lot better than uh, making hundreds of comparisons. So uh, Martin, I think that the, uh, I think the answer is yes, that absolutely makes sense. The other option with categorical features is if you suspect a level is important, go ahead and make a binary indicator and the random forest can handle binary indicators just fine. Uh, so that's what I like to do personally. The other thing you can do with categorical features is reduce the number of levels. So if you have 50 levels, I almost never will include that in a random forest. If I want to use a random forest, what I'll do is I'll group the levels. Hopefully there's some hierarchy and I'll use five or six levels instead of 50. And that uh, is a more reasonable way to use those features in this model. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, so Atul asks, how about a neural network? Uh, can you decode it by neural network? So neural networks, absolutely. This makes sense to use with a neural network. Uh, the only tricky thing with the neural network, uh, especially if you start talking about deep learning, uh, which I think is getting a lot of interest now uh, and has been for, for at least a decade uh, or more, is that it takes a long time to train a neural net, a deep learning model. So a deep learning model with GPUs is going to take on the order of hours to train most likely. It's really hard to justify doing target shuffling with a hundred or a thousand iterations. If you have to do it, uh, if you have to retrain the model every time. And in order for target shuffling to work, you have to retrain the model every time. So in theory, Absolutely, target shuffling makes sense to do with neural networks. In practice, uh, in practice, I don't end up using it for neural networks very often when I do have to build a neural network because they usually take so long to train that it's not, it's just not practical to try and to try and do a bunch of times. Uh, you also ask, is neural network neural network is mostly a black box? Does it fit in? Uh, does it fit in explainable AI? Uh, so this is this is less to do with target shuffling and vast search 
and more just a general data science question. Uh, it, honestly, I think the whole thing with neural networks being black boxes is a bit overblown. Um, I think lots of models are hard to explain. I think if you were to sit a person down off the street and try and explain a random forest to them, you're going to get the same glazed over look that you're going to get if you try to explain a neural network. Uh, it's really hard to explain any complicated model. I would fall back on the same sort of methods that you use uh, to explain any model to explain neural network, which is that uh, things like Lime, uh, which uh, I forget what it stands for, but it essentially tries to show for each observation how you got the prediction you did by uh, fiddling with the values in each input data or each input variable. Um, so I, I guess in answer to your question, I guess neural networks are less explainable than other models, but so many models are unexplainable that I, I, I don't think it's actually that much more of a problem than it used to be before neural networks became popular. Yes, I've absolutely had clients who, who have either asked for or asked explicitly not for neural networks because they're easier or harder to explain. Uh, and that's certainly true, but unless you're building a linear regression or a logistic regression, you're going to have a hard time explaining it regardless. If it's way more accurate, then it's probably worth using. If it's not way more accurate, then it's probably not worth using. Okay. Uh, Luca asked, so after the optimization loop to find the best parameter for the algorithm, uh, these might not actually be the very best. How can we handle this? Great question. And I should have addressed it uh, when I went over the actual loop originally. This, the grid search methodology for finding the best parameters is a good methodology uh, if all you're looking for is to find the best parameters. So with this all parameters loop, I have no reason to believe that this is not the best set of parameters. It could easily be the best set of parameters. All I'm saying, all the, the, the point of uh, what I was trying to get across was that even if this is the best set of parameters, don't trust the accuracy that comes out of that grid search uh, because the accuracy is going to be lower. Now, the best set of parameters is more likely to have a lower accuracy than a bad set of parameters is to have a low accuracy. So essentially they're all in the same playing field here, right? Every set of parameters is equally inhibited by this multiple iteration approach. Uh, and the result being, you can you know, reasonably trust that this is among the best set of parameters. Just don't trust the accuracy. Make sure you have a holdout set like I do here to evaluate the accuracy separately. So then if you're building this for a client, you can tell them, we did grid search, we found the best model. This is the accuracy you can expect from it, not the one that came out of grid search. Um, but in sort of a more general answer to that question, uh, this is sort of a contrived example. Most of these, I don't expect to have a big impact on the model. The data fraction isn't going to swing it much more accurate or much less accurate. Uh, the learning rate is really the only one that's going to matter a lot here, which is why when I look at grid search, the thing I'm looking for is consistency. You can see among the best models, it's almost always 0.05. To me, that suggests 0.05 is an important metric. The learning rate is an important metric, and I should be using 0.05. Uh, if you look at max depth, it's five, six, four, six, three, five, three, four. There's no consistency here. That's probably not an important metric. Same thing for data fraction is all over the place. That's probably not an important metric. Um, so when I do grid search, I look at the whole as opposed to just the top level. And you try and see which parameter, which parameter values are consistently towards the top of that grid search. Uh, to ask about XGBoost. So in practice, XGBoost is going to be uh, pretty similar to the Gradient Boosted Trees Learner. Uh, there might be a way in of getting to that XGBoost. There's probably an H2O node or something. Uh, I have tried it. Uh, it works really, really well. That's why it wins so many Kaggle competitions. It's not any more explainable than neural networks. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a great algorithm. Um, yeah, I think it's a great algorithm. It's just, I, I don't know. The XG is just extreme gradient boost, um, which is just a, a, a faster and slightly more nuanced implementation of the gradient boosted algorithm. 
So I wouldn't get too hung up on the details of between XG boost and gradient boost. Can we see the time taken in this simulation? I'm not able to see it. I don't know. Maybe one of the nine folks can chime in. I don't know of a way of checking after the fact how long a loop took to run. Uh, I can tell you just, yeah, I don't, it, it took it took at least several minutes, uh, I, I think, for this to run. These ones up here run relatively quickly, um, a couple minutes at most, on my computer at least. This one took longer, maybe five minutes. Uh, I think I also decreased the samples. No, I didn't. I left it at 2,000. Uh, if you increase the sample size, obviously, it takes a lot longer. Uh, oh, one thing I did do was I removed the categorical features because those make all the trees take much longer to build uh, because of just how decision trees work. So that made it run a lot faster as well. If you notice the water bottle I was drinking of, this is the Nime water bottle that I got at last year's Nime Summit. Can we view the dashboard and the mobile app also? I haven't. You're welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining. I have the slice clue. Oh, from Argentina. Nice. Uh, I have I have the slice clue uh, about the mobile app. I've never used it. Um, perhaps one of the nine representatives can answer that. All right. Someone calling from India. I guess that could be a few different time zones, but thank you. I know it's getting toward past the end of your workday. Oh, somebody says timer node. So you can set it up beforehand and use the timer node to see how long it takes. Thank you. All right, signing off. Thanks, everyone.